University of British Columbia, you may begin. I'd like you to close your eyes for a second and imagine. You're on a ship. She's not the prettiest. She's no shining white yacht, but she's beautiful in her own way. Powerful steel, painted red, rusted and scarred by the unforgiving sea. And around you, as far as your eyes can see, is nothing but endless blue, ocean fading into sky. You're on a vessel owned by Atlas Corp, a holding company with two subsidiaries, C-SPAN Corporation and recently acquired APR Energy. Judges, myself and my teammates from the University of British Columbia are pleased to present you our buy recommendation for Atlas Corp with a $16.50 US target price representing a 28.71% upside. Our analysis primarily focuses on C-SPAN Corporation as it comprises 88% of Atlas Abita. Despite recent global geopolitical tension, we remain strong on our buy recommendation and believe that Atlas Corp is undervalued by the market. Now, before we dive into details about Atlas, a little bit about the industry they primarily operate in, marine freight. Most of the world's goods are transported by sea. Of the primary marine freight industry segments, container shipping comprises about one third of the industry total. The industry is defined by three key business segments, containerized, dry bulk, and liquid bulk transportation. The industry is also characterized by three key business functions, asset or ship ownership, management, and operations, not unlike that of a commercial building. Given that marine vessels transport goods for world trade, industry demand is extremely elastic and driven by major macroeconomic factors like global GDP, consumer spending, and crude oil price. However, industry supply is inelastic in the short run due to the cost and time required to construct a new ship. This supply shortage, particularly recently, has resulted in higher freight and time charter prices. So where does C-SPAN fit in? C-SPAN serves as a container ship leasing company. Looking at its revenue, the majority of that comes from major international carriers. C-SPAN at the moment has 132 vessels with an overall capacity of 2 million TEUs. If we were to look at the competitive positioning for C-SPAN, we see that it is the largest container ship only leaser on the market by market capitalization. On the other hand, APR Energy is the other portion of Atlas's business. It is a power generation solution. It was acquired by Atlas back in 2019 as an attempt to diversify its portfolio and apply its asset leasing model to the energy industry. APR has a fleet, in, a fleet of two gigawatt and has experience operating in over 35 different countries. Under Atlas's control, they continue to acquire new contract and form new strategic partnerships. Today, we have three main reasons as to why we believe Atlas is a strong buy. First, in terms of its greener new build vessel programs, we see that Atlas expects 69 new vessels with an overall contract to cash flow of $11.5 billion against an overall cost of $7.6 billion. We note that 25 of these vessels are LNG powered ships, which will enable Atlas to take advantage of stricter environmental regulations, as well as increased demand for cleaner vessels. Secondly, Atlas has a strong and resilient business model, especially to market fluctuation, because, char because charter ships don't bear voyage costs, which are the highest volatility costs. Our third thesis is that Atlas has superior access to capital and is ensuring they maintain a disciplined capital allocation system. As you can see, Atlas holds significantly more debt than its competitors. However, they still have a current credit rating that is competitive with other industry leaders. They're also making one of their primary goals to achieve investment grade rating, which will result in even better financing in comparison to industry peers. Furthermore, Atlas has a diversified debt system and a global syndicate of supportive lenders. They are backed heavily by Fairfax Financial Holdings, who has shown to be willing to increase their stake in the company. These reasons indicate strong institutional confidence in the future financial prospects of the company. Now, Atlas Corp, in comparison to their peers, has a healthy balance sheet that supports growth, and ratio analysis has indicated to us that Atlas is either in line with peer companies or stronger for major leverage and liquidity metrics. We can see that their historical debt-to-equity ratio is slightly higher than industry average. However, they maintain a consistently stronger interest coverage ratio. Atlas also consistently beats out peers in terms of ROE, even through the pandemic. Furthermore, we found that historically, Atlas's free cash flow over sales has been in line with peers with an anomaly pandemic year. To capitalize on this balance sheet, we believe that C-SPAN's new world program, which has been fully financed, will generate a strong revenue pipeline that's based in heavily contracted charters. We forecasted sales based on fleet size, charter rates, and utilization rate, which we expect to stay constant at around 98%. For APR, we hold power capacity constant for the next four years and grow electricity price with GDP in Latin America. Furthermore, we grow utilization over time as APR transitions to focus on longer contracts. 
Seaspan's cost of revenue refers to the vessel operating costs, crew wages, and other maintenance and repair costs. Since revenue is fixed by long-term charters, we forecast costs on a per TEU basis, and we see that it's consistently decreased over the past five years. However, we believe that inflation in the near term may lead to temporary margin compression as wages and labor costs rise. After this period, we believe that the costs will return to their historical stagnation, leading to no change in real dollar terms. Finally, we believe that capital expenditures will increase in the short term to fund the new bill program. Since CapEx has historically composed of maintenance and growth, we think that for the next four years it's going to be filled by vessel commitments, after which it will only compose of maintenance CapEx. We derived our target price of $16.50 based on a 70, 20, and 10% weighting of DCF, net asset, and relative valuation. We decided on this weighting due to the predictability of C-SPAN's cash flows with fixed contracts, the asset-heavy nature of the industry, and the lack of appropriate competitors with similar business and financing mixes. And the football field summarizes our valuation approaches. For DCF, we forecasted a 10-year horizon to account for fixed charter lens before using a terminal growth rate after 2031. We base this on the projected growth of the shipping industry and the key geographies that Atlas operates in, and picks our exit multiple based on the industries as well. We further used a two-stage WAC to represent the, the, the deleveraging process. Although Atlas operates in a relatively stable industry, we still need to account for potential risks to cash flows. For example, cost of revenues may be impacted heavier by inflationary pressures. And therefore, we have three scenarios, and the assumptions that we varied are detailed here. We believe that the benefits far outweigh the costs. For example, Atlas must lose at least 15% of utilization before it realizes a negative return, which we believe is highly unlikely. Secondly, we performed a net asset valuation. Since Atlas operates in an asset-heavy industry, we determined its PNF ratio in comparison to peers, and we took APR's asset value at acquisition and accounted for depreciation and asset disposals. We discounted future charter cash flows and examined fleet composition to determine market values. As shown here, Atlas PNAF ratio of 0.4 is below the tier average of 0.43. Finally, we conducted a relative valuation of Atlas Corp using comparable companies for both C-SPAN and APR. We based these comparables on their similarity in business models, capital structure, fleet size with respect to market share, and profitability. We then used the median multiples for both peer groups to determine a weighted average industry multiple. Comparing this to Atlas's multiples, we found that the company is trading at a premium compared to its peers. However, we expect that this premium will persist in the following years. The relative valuation resulted in a 13.1% upside. Now, in the macro environment, Atlas is affected by numerous factors. Based on these external factors and internal company characteristics, we have identified 10 different investment risks tied to Atlas. We found the most impactful to be the geopolitical tension due to the Russia-Ukraine invasion and the potential for overconstruction of vessels as short-term demand rises. These risks are mitigated by the desirability of C-SPAN's new build fleet and the salvage value of the vessels. For our ESG analysis of Atlas, keeping in mind the sustainalytics as well as the IMO, we rate them with an overall score of 7.3 out of 10. Our score is primarily driven by C-SPAN's industry-leading environmental efforts, although pulled down by some social and governance concerns. Firstly, C-SPAN operates in an economically important industry with no commercially viable low-carbon alternatives. Despite this, between the 25 energy powered vessels, their saver program, the sustainability-linked bonds, C-SPAN is well-positioned to align themselves with the International Maritime Organization's climate strategy of reducing carbon dioxide by 40% by 2030. Furthermore, Atlas has a satisfactory social rating. From improved crew safety to Hong Kong flagships, C-SPAN's overall executive team consists of 33% female compared to an industry average of 5%. Our only concern here is that the majority of the vessel crew is primarily hired from India in order to take advantage of lower wages. Finally, in terms of governance, we observe that as a stellar board of directors and executive team. Our only concern here is shared concentration, given that Fairfax Financial Holdings, which is a firm similar to a Canadian Berkshire Hathaway, holds about 46% of the common shares, while Dennis R. Washington holds 18% of the common shares. We note that while this is a downside for governance, it is actually a good side in terms of financial growth because we have a strong financial backing. Judges, as the container ship you're aboard glides into a glittering port, between C-SPAN's new build program, resilient business structure, and focus on rating, we hope you share our conclusion that Atlas Corp is a buy with a 28.71% upside and $16.50 target price. Thank you. Uh, I have
have a question on your capacity. So the TU capacity versus its competitors, how is the historical utilization rate versus its competitors and what is projected? I think you pro you mentioned you project a, a stable utilization rate moving forward. So uh, with the increase of TEU capacity, do you think that the utilization rate will be stable and why? Yeah, absolutely. I can take this question. So when we were looking at uh, forecasting container ships, leasing the se that segment of the business, we looked at the existing contracts and the charter lens that they have. And a lot of these contracts are actually they're made for you know 10 years 24 years and so on so it's actually a very long um very long charter length time and after which we sort of forecasted based on uh, market demand which we believe is going to sort of uh return to pre-covid levels by then so that's why we have our utilization rate sort of hovering around um you can see here we have it hovering around 98.5 percent or so for 20 for 2023 and all the way to 2031 where we kind of forecasted slowly going down to about 98 percent utilization and that utilization we do think is going to stay constant at around that rate because we do find that when we look at uh in comparison to it, their competitors as you've as you've mentioned when we look at competitors um we see that C-SPAN actually has a much higher contracted duration in terms of the contracts, and they have much higher contracted revenue, which is why we don't believe this is a high risk. The decrease in utilization rate is a high risk to C-SPAN. And even if it is a risk, we do account for it in our sensitivity and scenario analysis. So when we looked at conducting scenario analysis, we said, what if utilization rate drops to 90%? What if it drops to 86%? What if it drops to 74%? And we find that it's only if they dropped 15% all the way to 70% that we changed this recommendation to a sell, which is really unlikely because historically, if we look at past 10 years, their lowest utilization rate has been around 95%. And so going to 74% would result would mean that they suddenly lost a significant customer. Thanks. Where's the APR uh, energy valuation in the um, in the overall um, uh, valuation that you have? Sure, I can take this one. So at the moment, APR Energy consists about 12% of the overall company's EBITDA compared to C-SPAN, which I believe still holds a majority of that uh, EBITDA of like 88%. And we've sort of taken that very conservative approach, understanding that you know we don't know whether or not APR is going to be growing long-term. Uh, and if we actually swap to the strategic plan, the way that APR kind of aligns itself with CSAN, um, and it might seem like a weird mix at the beginning, is that it's in terms of three different areas, in terms of alternative fuel, because we see that CSAN as a company is trying to transition and break into sort of an environmental uh, leading efforts. At the moment, uh, looking at sort of the shipping industry as a whole, a lot of people, what they're doing, a lot of competitors, they're kind of holding back on seeing what is the best source of fuel and holding back on that. And while CSAN is actually actively trying to invest, to try to be one of the first movers in order to capitalize in the industry, especially as we kind of see potential emergence of like green corridors or more sustainably linked ships and bonds, et cetera. The second way sort of how APR ties into the valuation is we, if we look at back into the stuff financials, um, we've kind of been very conservative with the overall forecasted growth. A lot of analysts um, in the report state that APR is estimated to, to grow significantly at around 20%. We've kind of forecasted as APR is grow to be pretty stagnant over the next five years in order to just be conservative, making sure that, you know, this doesn't affect our valuation, that the bulk of our valuation is still mostly dependent on C-SPAN as a business, since it is the core business at the moment of, of Atlas. And furthermore, just kind of one add on to that, um, in terms of AP, uh, APR and how they're doing under Atlas's overall control, we see that they're actually increasing uh, in sort of the contracts. Um, if we go to sort of the APR fleet deployment schedule uh, that we have in the appendix, we see that they're actually transitioning into slightly longer contract rates as well. So in the past, they've been mostly kind of operating under short term contracts because of uh, state grid stability projects, et cetera. And we see that APR is really under the span of um, Atlas really trying to transition into longer, more safer contract of cash flows. And that's exactly what we see here. Um, I can go into more detail on some of the projects, but that sort of hopefully answers your question.
how do you justify the weights uh, for your overall valuation? I mean, you also mentioned that there is a lack of competitors. Why do you even assign 10% to the relative valuation? Yeah, so I can comment on relative weighting and Ashwin can sort of comment on relative valuation. So when we were looking at overall value, uh, determining the weighting of the overall valuation, we sort of thought what would make the most sense for Atlas given the way that it, given the way that the company is structured and given the industry that it operates in. So we thought, okay, Atlas has very high contracted cash flows. A lot of their contracts are extending, you know, 10 years, again, 10 years, more than 10 years into the future. So we thought that the DCF valuation should be weighted significantly higher. So that's why we weighted DCF at 70%, because we think that the contracted cash flows sort of provide a, a stability, a stable driver, revenue driver, as opposed to, for example, tech companies, which don't really have that stability of cash flows. So that's one with DCF. And then with NAV valuation, we sort of, we wanted to use NAV valuation and weight it higher than relative valuation because it is an asset heavy industry. So worst comes to worst, what C SPAN can what Alice can do is after the contracts expire, they sell off other ships, they sell off APR, they get rid of all of that. And we think, okay, we evaluate the value based on their net assets total. And then with relative valuation, uh, Ashwin can sort of speak to why we don't yeah. have, uh, we, we, we didn't really see a mix of appropriate competitors. Yeah, so we, we mainly saw that lack of appropriate mix with competitors. For well, APR with the uh, recent uh, warrants exercised by Fairfax Financial Holdings, around 25 million common shares, now they own more than 50% of the company. Uh, do you see any relevant changes in the governance or strategy of the firm? Why or why not? Yeah, so I can uh, take that uh, to begin. And then I think James can jump in as well in terms of governance. So th we definitely recognize that as a governance issue. So there's, it's definitely a twofold uh, situation here. One where um, we do show that the shareholders are confident in the growth of the company. And, and that is great as they're exercising their warrants. And um, that has $200 million more to pay down the debt. However, there definitely is a governance um, situation here. And I think uh, Atlas has also spoken about um, diversifying their, their investors and their debt holders as well. So that Fairfax Financial Holdings does not have um, the sole power in the company. So I think James can, uh, can talk a little bit more about the governance situation there. Yeah, kind of expanding on that. Um, when we sort of went through our presentation, we did make note of the fact that uh, this is a relatively high uh, kind of shareholder concentration, especially in terms of Fairfax. Um, although on the governance side, it might seem a little bit uh, on sort of the, the riskier side for individual investors, this is could potentially be actually a good side and a positive side on the financial side because Fairfax uh, financials, I believe we have an, an, an appendix side there, has an extremely strong track record of, of financial performance of investing in companies um, in terms of value-based companies. And we see that even during the 2008 era, where a lot of the companies and the equivalents are actually um, not performing well, Fairfax Financials actually was, in a, was able to kind of still have a really good portfolio holding in relative of their peers. And we see that Fairfax also adds as a very strong financial backing for Atlas. Um, so all, some of the debt uh, sort of issuance and financial side actually came from Fairfax Financials as well. So it's a really strong sort of core support group for Atlas, especially since we're playing in such a heavy industry, heavy comp industry. It's really important for Atlas to have a strong financial backer. And that's essentially how, how sort of Fairfax and, and financial acts um, in terms of Atlas. Speaking of that, you mentioned the company is very disciplined. Do they have any covenants, especially given their net debt to EBITDA levels? Yeah, uh, that's a yeah, good so question. Good. So yeah. I can I can take that as well. Go ahead, James. Go for it, Ashton. Okay, I was okay. going to say in so, terms of their strategy uh, for um, their strategy going forward for for the debt. You can see that the senior unsecured notes are are going up a lot higher. Um, so to get the investment grade credit rating that we were speaking to, the, we the one of the things they wanted to do was of course maintain a high interest coverage ratio and continue deleveraging. But they also want to shift towards a more flexible, unsecured capital structure. So they're not having to put up their vessels um, in terms of secured notes. So you can see that going up there. And that's how we see the path to investment grade rating um, happening. And we also forecasted a net debt to EBITDA ratio going down significantly 
um, going forward to 2031. Do they have a, does management have any target? And uh, for the covenants, uh, I didn't hear the answer. Maybe there was a... Um, so in regards to the targets, uh, so the way that they, ha they haven't seen as explicit targets, but the way that they've sort of looked at, the way that we sort of see it is um, with the Atlas versus Deneos. So when we think about Atlas versus Deneos, uh, Deneos also de uh, also took on a significant new build program initially, and then they delever deleveraged over time. Um, and so that's where we sort of see Atlas following down that path. Free cash flow have been negative for like the last two years. So how are they planning to uh, to deleverage? A lot of their deleveraging is going to come from, again, the new build program. So when they do the new build program and the cash flow start coming in, um, that's when they're like, again, it's sort of similar to what Deneos did. Uh, and let me just go through Deneos slide. And so when we look at finding that another uh, another quick deleveraging strategy that they're doing, as uh, was mentioned before, with the exercising of the warrants for 25 million common shares, that added 200 million dollars in cash that um, they said is going to go towards the deleveraging process. Yeah. So that's what we sort of have the Atlas. We see it following down a similar trajectory to Deneo's which deleveraged from 7.3 to 2.5 in 2021. One other thing just to add on as well is um, this high, this high leverage and what we're, what, what you can see with Deneos and what we have seen and will be seeing again with Atlas is this is just um, the nature of the industry because their assets, container ships are such high value items, um, it is necessary to assume assume this much debt and then deleverage it with cash flows from the, like, you know, like there's initially obviously a large negative cash flow because they're paying the cost of constructing the vessel and not receiving any cash flows. And then once they start receiving cash flows from the, those vessels, um, that helps with that. And I mean, as well, Atlas uh, already, as we mentioned before, already has contracted cash flows for all of the vessels they're getting built. So they do not order vessels unless they have a contract in place for those vessels. Um, just, okay, thank you. That's very clear. Just to understand, it has economic contraction or let's say a recession, potential recession, has been taken into account in your valuation? Um, yeah, for sure. So I can uh, I can jump in on this one as well. Um, so uh, right now, just sort of looking at container ship market outlooks, um, the outlooks are very positive moving forward. Um, if we look historically at what's happened, if we look at uh, the market and the effect of the 2007 financial crisis, which is one of the most significant recent economic events on any any company, um, obviously, uh, but particularly devastating for the shipping industry. Um, you can you can see we we had a huge a much larger proportionate decrease in maritime trade versus GDP um, in two thousand and nine as a result of the financial crisis. And what we had then was sort of leading up to the financial crisis. GDP was growing. The global economy was growing. And company order books were very high. So there was a large amount of container ships being ordered, more container ships on order than um, necessary for consumer demand. And then obviously there was a drop in GDP. And because there were so many container ships on order, this drop in GDP was pretty devastating for a lot of companies. We had a lot of uh, more... more um, Shipping carriers 
than necessarily vessel owners. Uh, there, I believe there were, was uh, one major shipping carrier uh, had a bankruptcy resulting from the situation. So it is obviously a concern. Time. Thank you.